So let me welcome you all to the first uh, seminar in the Jewish History Seminar at CES for this academic year. We usually start in September, but uh, to use British understatement, this year has been just a bit challenging. And, uh, but we are off to a, a wonderful start. And uh, this is the first of three Jewish History Seminars this term. We will be uh, meeting with uh, Mahal Dekel on November 6th. Uh, she'll be talking about her book on the Tehran children. And then December 3rd, we have um, Shmuel Feiner, a uh, wonderful historian of the 18th century, who will be talking about his new book on 1782, as the year when modern Jewish history began. So if you want to know why 1782 is so important, please come to his seminar. Uh, today, we have the great honor of hosting Professor Daniel uh, Schwartz. I'm going to introduce him briefly. And uh, I just want to, before moving forward, I really want to th thank uh, uh, the um, Center for European Studies, uh, Vasilis and, and Michael for making this possible. The technical arrangements can be a little daunting, very grateful. So I'm just explaining to you that um, you can use the Q&A feature on Zoom to type in questions or comments while Dan is speaking and I'll be gathering them up. He's gonna talk for about 30, 35 minutes and uh, then we're gonna have a Q and A conversation period. So I wanna thank you in advance for your questions. And let me just say a word about, about, um, about Dan Schwartz, uh, who is a professor at George Washington University and also chair of the Department of History there. And uh, he has a remarkable range in uh, intellectual and cultural history, the two fields being quite different um, in that uh, cultural history, if it's not simply the history of high ideas um, or in the, the fine arts can very much be about how people interpret their experience and you know, make sense out of their lives. And so it's very much social history. So just to get a sense of Dan's range, his first book, which came out only eight years ago, and I think Dan, you only got your PhD in 2007. So you're, you're very young and very prolific. Uh, so Dan's first book was called The First mm -hmm. Modern Jew, Spinoza and the History of an Image, so kind of a reception history of Spinoza uh, in, um, in the modern world. And it was a book that received quite a number of accolades, including uh, co-winning the 2012 Salo Baron Prize <clears throat> for the best first book in Jewish studies uh, from the American Academy for Jewish Research. He was also a finalist for a National Jewish Book Award in that, in that year. And then Dan produced more recently, just last year, an edited volume uh, through the Brandeis University series of um, like doc documentary readers. They're really wonderful teaching tools. And he edited one called Spinoza's Challenged Jewish Thought, Writings on His Life, Philosophy, and Legacy. But then the book that Dan will be talking about today, and I actually have a copy. I did have only a fraction of my Cambridge Library books here in Toronto with me where I'm sheltering in place, but I actually have Dan's book here. Uh, it's a wonderful book and I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, so the book Ghetto, the History of a Word is what Dan's gonna be talking about today. And I just wanna mention just when I refer to Dan's broad range, um, uh, he's also now working on a book on the Lower East Side. So there's, there's a lot going on in Dan's research uh, profile. Wonderful to have you with us. Very much looking forward to your remarks and uh, the floor is yours. Um, uh, thank you so much, Derek. Thank you for inviting me uh, to present here. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so I wanna start by just refreshing your memory about a controversy uh, that erupted in the summer of 2019 uh, after Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or AOC, uh, the fiery left-wing freshman Democrat from New York called the Trump administration's immigration detention sites concentration camps. So in an argument that went on for weeks and ultimately spurred new protest movements against ICE and the administration's immigration policy, politicians from both sides of the aisle, op-ed columnists, Jewish organizations, cable news journalists, academics, and of course the Twitterati on the right and the left clashed over whether the term concentration camp was appropriate or misplaced. Those who objected blasted the designation for, promote, for promoting a fallacious analogy between the Holocaust and the administration's treatment of immigrants, and in so doing diminishing the tragedy of the six million. Those who defended the label contended that concentration camps were not a Nazi invention, and that even the Nazi concentration camps were different from death camps such as Sobibor and Treblinka. 
Moreover, they argued that for slogans like never again to mean anything, mobilizing Holocaust memory to resist all forms of dehumanization was necessary and legitimate. But for much of the summer of 2019, debate raged not only over the morality of the detention centers, but over how they should be named. The concentration camp controversy was a salient reminder that language is frequently a battlefield. We tend to think that we have minimized the scope of disagreement when we boil a debate down to semantics. It's just semantics, we are wont to say. The reality is that so many of our cultural arguments manifest as arguments over words, over what they mean, how they are used, and who gets to define them. Once you label something, you change how people perceive it. Indeed, the phrase one man's terrorist is another's freedom fighter, however cliche, highlights the degree to which names matter. The phenomenon being described may be the same, but how it is termed can make all the difference. Uh, and then of course, there are a host of other examples, contemporary examples of this that we could cite, the ongoing debate over whether uh, the term fascism is appropriately applied to the Trump administration, debates over whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism and the like. The 500 year history of the word ghetto was similarly fraught. Up until roughly the mid 19th century, ghetto meant simply a legally compulsory segregated and enclosed Jewish quarter of an Italian town or city. Since then, the applications and associations of the term have multiplied. The ghetto has been identified with everything from miniature bastions of traditional Judaism to immigrant enclaves in the big city. It has been used to refer to pre-genocidal sites of the Nazi Holocaust, as well as to inner city neighborhoods populated by black and brown people. A noun with a long history of being used as an adjective from the ghetto Jew to that so ghetto, a term that depending on how it is used and who is using it can suggest both danger and security, weakness and toughness, social pathology and communal solidarity, a prison and a fortress, a sociological concept that is anything but value free, a keyword of both the Jewish and the African American experiences, the ghetto historically has been all of the above. In its very ubiquity and elusiveness, it exemplifies Nietzsche's claim and on the genealogy of morals that quote, only that which has no history is definable. The history of ghettos is to a substantial degree, a history of struggle and argument over the meaning, usage and application of the label ghetto itself. So in the rest of my remarks this afternoon, I wanna highlight a few key shifts in the history of the ghetto as word and concept. First, I'm gonna trace the origins of the ghetto, explaining how it evolved from a Venetian place name with no Jewish associations to a generic Jewish space found throughout early modern Italy. Next, I'll discuss the resurrection of the term ghetto to designate new Jewish spaces from voluntary immigrant neighborhoods like New York's Lower East Side to the holding pens of Nazi occupied Eastern Europe that were as dissimilar from the pre-emancipation Italian ghettos as they were from each other. Finally, I'll address the transference of the ghetto idea and label from Jews to blacks before closing with a reflection on whether amid all these ruptures, we can speak of a single continuous history of ghettos. So our story begins in Venice. In 1509, an alliance of armies led by France, the Holy Roman Empire and the Papal States attacked Venice and overran its mainland territories. Many refugees from these areas fled to Venice and Jews who had only briefly in the late 14th century been permitted to establish an open Jewish community in Venice proper were among them. The question emerged of what was to be done with these Jews. Some were of the view that there was economic advantage to be had in permitting the Jews to stay and serve as money lenders in the city itself. Others, especially friars and preachers, strenuously opposed any relaxation of the government's policy against allowing Jews to reside in Venice permanently, objecting in particular to their presence all over the city. Out of this debate came a compromise solution proposed by a Venetian senator, arguing that it was bad that Jews were residing in Venice wherever they chose. He proposed, quote, to send all of them to live in the ghetto nuovo or the new ghetto, which is like a castle and to make drawbridges and close it with a wall. The Duke of Venice and the Senate gave their support to this proposal. And on March 29, 1516, an edict was passed ordering all Jews then living throughout the city, as well as all those yet to come, to go immediately to live together in the Ghetto Nuovo. Christian inhabitants of this area were compelled to vacate their homes. All outward facing doors and windows on the island were to be bricked over. 
and gates were to be erected in two places to be opened at sunrise and locked at sunset. In imposing residential segregation on its Jews, Venice had precedent it could draw on, though it does not appear that they did so knowingly. The idea of a voluntary Jewish street or Jewish quarter was as old as the diaspora itself. And the idea of a wall with gates was hardly a novelty in a pre-modern world where cities were typically fortified. We know of at least one Jewish community in the 11th century Rhineland that was housed in a neighborhood with gates and walls, though this seems to have been a measure for their security meant to induce them to settle. Even if we stress the element of force and exclusivity in the idea of the ghetto, here too there was precedent. Starting in the 13th century, there were church councils that intermittently called for the complete segregation of Jews from Christians, though until the 15th century, these were rarely heeded by secular rulers. In the final decades of Jewish life in Christian Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella pressed for the creation of mandatory and homogeneous Jewish quarters, or juderias, though they ended up expelling the Jews in 1492 before the policy was fully implemented. Most of these early efforts to isolate Jews proved abortive. However, Frankfurt on Main's compulsory and exclusive Judengasse preceded Venice's ghetto, Venice's ghetto by some 54 years that lasted just as long. If it is somewhat problematic to view the Venetians as originators of the idea of the ghetto, a stronger case can be made for their title to the term itself, though even this must be qualified. The Venetians did not coin the word ghetto, at least in its sense of an enclosed Jewish quarter. Most historians believe that this meaning had its roots in geographic happenstance. The fact that the island to which Jews were restricted in Venice was already known as the Ghetto Nuovo. Ghetto itself is thought to derive from the verb jetare, meaning to throw or to cast, which would evoke the copper foundries that had once occupied the site. The application of the word ghetto to the Jewish quarter thus developed out of osmosis and not as a result of a deliberative process. Venice may hold the copyright to the term ghetto, as one scholar has aptly put it, but it's important to keep the extent of its innovation in check. The Venetians did not set out in 1516 to institute a new modus operandi for the treatment of Jews in Christian Europe. Their invention was largely tactical, a temporizing response to an unforeseen development a pragmatic balancing of economic and religious interests governed by local short-term thinking. The same cannot be said for Rome, which followed Venice in segregating its Jews some four decades later. In 1555, Pope Paul IV, in his bull Cum Nimis Absurdum, confined the Jews of Rome and really the Jews throughout the Papal States to an enclosure along the banks of the Tiber on the spot of the main traditional area of Jewish settlement. Seven years later, Pope Pius V used the Latin word gectum to refer to this enclave in a bull of his own, the first evidence of the migration of the name ghetto to Rome, though Rome's ghetto would also always be known as the Seraglio or Claustro degli Ebrei. Starting at this point, it became possible to live not merely in the ghetto of Venice, but a ghetto. And in the aftermath of the Vatican's decision to concentrate Jewish populations in the Papal States, both the institution of a compulsory Jewish quarter and the labeling of such quarters as ghettos spread throughout Italy. Already at its inaugural transfer from Venice to Rome, the concept of the ghetto had undergone a mutation. In Venice, the Jews did not have a long continuous tradition of settlement prior to the creation of the ghetto. Ghettoization in this case was part of the creation of a community. Jews had lived in Rome, on the other hand, from before the establishment of the Roman Empire. Certainly they had their own de facto neighborhoods, but their legal segregation in 1555 was a rupture, not a beginning in the history of this community. It is not surprising then that it was among Roman Jewry that the popular folk etymology linking the word ghetto to the Hebrew get or bill of divorce originated. For Rome's Jews, the ghetto truly was a heightened estrangement from their Gentile neighbors relative to what they were accustomed to. In the 19th century, when this etymology was still broadly accepted, the idea of the ghetto as a divorce was typically interpreted in a tragic light. But this does not appear to have been how contemporary Jews perceived their separation. The Jews of Verona seem to have marked their anniversary of their ghettoization each year with a celebratory service at which they recited special hymns and paraded Torah scrolls throughout the synagogue. Early modern Italian Jews argued with authorities over the boundaries or location of the ghetto. They sought when possible to expand its size, to ease its congestion and to improve their living conditions. 
Yet they did not, for the most part, protest the idea of the ghetto as unjust. It is difficult to find in the expansive Jewish literature of the early modern period any, ex any expression of acute distress caused by the experience of being forced to live in separate quarters. Not everyone celebrated it, to be sure, but few appear to have mourned it. Over the past 30 to 40 years, scholars have increasingly questioned the degree to which ghettoization really did breed cultural isolation. The thrust of the newest scholarship on the ghetto has been to portray the ghetto as a paradoxical space a space of legally imposed separation and concentration, yet also of comings and goings and cross-cultural encounters, a space that united Jews of different backgrounds and at the same time frequently magnified their differences, a space that divided while also mediating between Jews and Christians, even as it also mediated between the medieval and the modern, a space in which unexpectedly Jewish culture and religion flourished. Far from simply representing the culmination and formalization of medieval segregation, the ghetto worked by effect, if not intent, to embed Jews within the fabric of the city by providing them with a place of their own, however limited and stigmatized, a halfway house between acceptance and expulsion, in the words of one scholar. From a quasi prison for Jews, the ghetto has come to figure in the latest research as a place of real yet permeable boundaries. We generally think of the ghetto as being of greatest relevance for Jewish life in the centuries before emancipation, a time that is often periodized as the age of ghettos or ghetto times. My own view is that the ghetto came to have far more of a purchase on Jewish consciousness after emancipation, when far from receding into the past, it gained a centrality in discourse by and about Jews that paradoxically it did not have in the so-called age of ghettos that preceded it. The ghetto may have shaped the horizons and possibilities of those who passed the bulk of their lives therein, but it was not as freighted or as much of a fixation as it would later become, perhaps because it was taken for granted. With that, let me turn to the changing understanding of the ghetto in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Many of the ghettos of Italy and Central Europe were razed to the ground by French armies during the Napoleonic Wars as part of their campaign to export the French Revolution and its emancipation of the Jews to all the areas they conquered. In some cases, most notably in Rome, Napoleon's defeat and the restoration of the old regime resulted in a re-ghettoization of Jews. The plight of Roman Jewry, which had been steadily impoverished and worn down as a result of papal pressure over the centuries, was a focus of a great deal of attention on the part of both Jews and non-Jews in the middle decades of the 19th century, by which point the fact this community was still ghettoized was seen as anomalous. Rome's ghetto was finally dismantled in 1870 after the popes were stripped of all temporal power and the project of Italian unification was completed. It was the last of the old European ghettos to fall. Most of the European ghettos were leveled as part of urban renewal projects so that there are only a handful that one can visit today that even somewhat resemble what they once looked like. In Venice, many of the buildings, including the synagogues and the layout of the ghetto were preserved so that it offers the best opportunity to see the ghetto as it was. Starting in the middle decades of the 19th century, the word ghetto began to be absorbed into other languages and to take on a variety of figurative meanings. If the term had previously symbolized the spatial division between Jew and Christian, now it increasingly was pressed into service to picture the gap between tradition and modernity. Not only did it become more common to refer to previously mandatory Jewish section by the newly imported ghetto label, so for example, the Frankfurt ghetto as opposed to Judengasse, the Prague ghetto rather than Judenstadt. The term also came to be attributed to Jewish sections that were not legally segregated, but were densely Jewish and deeply religious. A whole composite notion of ghetto Judaism took root in this period. This was composed of various images, sounds, and affects, but above all, it conjured a small world where the old ways remained ascendant and where the Jews remained socially and spiritually insular, whether as a result of official segregation. So for example, the Pale of Settlement is commonly referred to in the 19th and early 20th century as the Russian ghetto, or simply because they had yet to escape the invisible walls that confined them. Emancipated Jews imagined the ghetto on the one hand as the ultimate foil to their self-concept and current situation, as a warren of dark and narrow alleys and folk superstitions that contrasted with the open vistas and scientific worldview of the enlightened present. 
Others were more ambivalent, experiencing pangs of nostalgia for a milieu whose thick and unselfconscious Jewishness beckoned to those who felt the sense of aloneness and anonymity in their new situation as modern Jews. What is clear is that as a result of the semantic transformations of the 19th century, ghetto became a word that evoked not only an enclosed space, but a whole culture, an ethos, and a mentality, a state of mind, if you will. The immigrant ghetto, with which the word ghetto migrated from Europe to America that emerged in the last quarter of the 19th century as a result of mass Jewish emigration out of Eastern Europe, was seen as a resurrection of a social form previously thought to be near extinction. If the overall arc of the ghetto concept in the 19th century ran from place to idea or metaphor, the immigrant ghetto reversed this by attaching the name ghetto once again to a particular place. When the term ghetto was first applied to overcrowded Jewish immigrant neighborhoods in American cities, it had an alien ring, in particular to Americans unfamiliar with the term for a European neighborhood to which Jews were confined by law or who instinctively associated the word with Europe. Quote, it seems strange that there should be a ghetto in an American city and especially in New York, the author of a profile of New York's Jewish section wrote in Harper's Magazine in 1878. But there certainly is on the east side of the Bowery below Canal Street, almost as distinctive a Jewish quarter as is to be found in any of the old European cities where the Jews for centuries have been a proscribed race. Over the next decades, despite the protests of those who rejected the application of the label to neighborhoods that were legally voluntary and more mixed in reality than in the conventional wisdom, such areas came to be known as ghettos. As this new usage of the term became normative, the meaning of the ghetto concept was modified. First in fiction, memoirs, and popular journalism, and eventually in the emerging field of urban sociology, densely crowded Jewish enclaves like New York's East Side, at one time dubbed the New York Ghetto, and Chicago's West Side, came to be seen as way stations tasked with mediating an immigrant journey that was at once spatial, running from east to west, and temporal, running from the old to the new. The ghetto was no longer simply before modernity. It was a kind of temporary holding center located between tradition and modernity. During the period of mass immigration, there was extensive disagreement over what should be done about the immigrant ghettos. Immigration restrictionists attributed a herding instinct to Jews and condemned the ghettos as sites of filth, overcrowding, disease, penury, and social vices. Assimilated Jews anxious about rising anti-Semitism occasionally argued for breaking up the ghettos by dispersing newcomers to rural districts in the American interior. Others defended the ghettos as essentially temporary clusterings that would disappear with the steady acculturation of the immigrant Jews or at least their descendants. Some even trained a spotlight on the virtues and eclecticism of the ghetto as it was or on the value of Jewish concentration per se including in ways that challenge the equation of Americanization with melting pot assimilation. In the debate over the immigrant ghetto, the appropriateness of the word itself, ghetto, often stood in the dock. In a, 19, in a 1908 column that appeared in a reformed Jewish newspaper called The American Israelite, one Molly Ida Osherman, a Chicago resident, decried what she alleged was the misapplication of the term that had become normative in newspapers and everyday language. Osherman rejected the alighting of the difference between the medieval European ghetto and the American immigrant enclave. There is no valid reason why our Jewish section must be stigmatized with the word ghetto, she claimed, adding, I am led to believe that our people as a whole, it matters not what the condition of their finances or the division of the city in which they live the state of their general culture or intellectuality should cooperate in eliminating from the daily vocabulary that grading a necessary term, the ghetto. In that way, we will tend to discourage its use from the press also. In fact, an American Jew with far better political connections than Molly Osherman had already succeeded in pressuring one major newspaper to do just that. In 1904, Louis Marshall, a prominent lawyer and American Jewish leader who would uh, go on to become the first president uh, of the American Jewish Committee, wrote Adolf Oakes, the editor of the New York Times, requesting that the newspaper adopt a rule banning the word ghetto. 
that a lot of Jewish citizens live in a certain portion of the city, Marshall explained, is not a sufficient reason for applying to them a word which in history has been identified with contumely, oppression, ridicule, and hatred. Oakes agreed to this request, noting in his reply to Marshall, his instructions to prohibit the use of the word ghetto with reference to the Jewish quarters of the East Side. A search of the archives of the Times reveals no reference to various permutations of the phrase New York ghetto from 1903 to the 1920s, precisely when this label was at its most popular. The Nazi ghetto turned the model of the immigrant ghetto on its head. As a revival of the legal institution of the ghetto, the Nazi ghetto inverted the direction of the immigrant ghetto entirely. It was a place whose arrow appeared to point backward, not forward in time. The only similarity between the two was that both were conceived as temporary phenomena. The way station would come to serve as the operative metaphor for the Nazi ghetto as well, but only as a stop en route to genocide. Historians of the Holocaust like Christopher Browning and Don Michman have challenged the commonly held belief that the Nazis established ghettos to facilitate the rounding up of Jews for extermination. Still in practice, they often served as a prelude to the death camps and killing fields and thus gave rise to an altogether different temporality in which ghettoization was a stage not of assimilation, but annihilation. In light of all the evidence of the variety of Jewish ghettos during the Holocaust and of their conceptual and functional change over time, it is increasingly difficult to speak of the Nazi ghetto as a uniform phenomenon. What is clear, however, is that the Nazi ghetto bore little in common with the early modern ghetto besides the name. Notably, the Nazis in some areas sought to bar the use of the word ghetto, most notably in Warsaw, where they insisted that the ghetto be officially referred to as the Jewish Living District, or the Yudische Wohnbezirk. Other names employed elsewhere included Jewish Living Area and Jewish Settlement. The goal was to present the all-Jewish area as a kind of natural region or habitat, rather than the coercive enclosure that it was. The Nazis sought disingenuously to avoid the pejorative connotations of the word ghetto. But even before the Nazi ghettos turned deliberately genocidal, they were intended to segregate, marginalize, control, and exploit Jews well in excess of anything the founders of the early modern ghetto could have envisioned. Considering how crucial the word ghetto has been to the Jewish experience, the past several decades have been striking for the extent to which the term has journeyed beyond it. The word ghetto today, writes one American urban historian, just like everything else these days, has gone global. Throughout Europe, politicians invoke the specter of the ghetto to stoke fears about allegedly unassimilable immigrant and usually Muslim enclaves in cities. Rap musicians and street artists of widely different backgrounds identify more positively with the term as a badge of authenticity. And social scientists debate its application to marginalized urban spaces around the world. For all this explosion of ghetto talk, the word ghetto has arguably become central to the collective memory and identity of only one other people beyond Jews. The African-American experience strikes me as the only other case in which the word ghetto has truly acquired keyword status. Once thought of primarily as a Jewish term, the word ghetto is now perceived around the world as a symbol of Black America, first and foremost. This shift is a result of two related yet distinct developments. First and most obviously, the transfer of the ghetto from Jewish to black can be told as a political and socioeconomic history of migration waves, neighborhood succession, and racist laws and practices that created, abetted, and helped to maintain substantial urban segregation of African Americans, precisely at a time when American Jews were taking advantage of opportunities for mobility held out by the suburban transformation of the metropolitan areas of North American cities. The Jewish to black transfer can also be told as a cultural history of the importing of the term ghetto into the vocabulary of the African American experience and the gradual eclipse of its Jewish associations from the zenith of Jim Crow in the early 20th century through the post-war era. Just as it was not preordained that the word ghetto would transcend its Venetian origins, to become the standard term for enclosed Jewish quarters in early modern Italy, or that it would then break through the break free, I'm sorry, of its Italian roots to become a more general symbol of pre-modern Jewishness in the old Jewish neighborhood. So too was not a given that a concept and metaphor synonymous with Jewishness would become synonymous with blackness. 
And just as the reasons for a nature of black ghettoization have occasioned controversy, so too is the use of the term ghetto in reference to this phenomenon. African Americans began employing the term ghetto to refer to their own residential segregation as early as the 19 teens, at a time when several American cities were passing zoning ordinances that prohibited black people from living on blocks where the majority of residents were white. Such laws were found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in 1917. Black usage of ghetto became more widespread amidst the legal battle over restrictive covenants in the aftermath of World War II. A 1948 report on segregation in Washington, D.C., published the same year that the Supreme Court banned judicial enforcement of restrictive covenants in Shelley versus Kramer, contained a chapter on housing segregation entitled Ghettos in the Capital. The authors made no bones about their intent to evoke the specter of the ghettos of the Holocaust in the way they referred to the residential segregation of Blacks. Ghetto is an ugly word, one chapter opened. To a Dane, it is ugly to any Nazi victim, to anyone who saw how Hitler placed a yellow mark on Jews so they could be made to live apart, suffer apart, die apart. To an American, it is ugly. The new black reference for ghetto truly came to the fore in the 1960s as urban race uprisings starting in the middle of the decade vaulted segregation, segregated areas onto the front pages of newspapers and onto television screens across the nation and the globe. Digital history resources reveal how usage of the word ghetto soared in English in the 1960s and 1970s, and how phrases like Negro ghetto or increasingly black ghetto came to eclipse Jewish ghetto. The African-American psychologist Kenneth Clark's 1965 book, Dark Ghetto, probably did more than any other individual work to connect ghetto and black in the mainstream media. The title of the book was doubly appropriate. For Clark, the darkness of the dark ghetto was evident not only in the skin color of its inhabitants, but in the fact that he saw such areas as bleak, desperate places, devoid of faith in a better future, and awash in self-destructive behavior and social vices, even as they were defended by others as the home of vibrant culture and community. The transference of the word ghetto from Jewish to black enclaves stirred controversy. Some pointed to the lack of statutory laws restricting African-Americans to prescribed areas. But that argument overlooked the whole range of state actions, from the enforcement of restrictive covenants before 1948, to federal support for redlining and the denial of home insurance for Blacks in the suburbs, to the building of public housing in already segregated districts that made Black residential concentration far more than purely a case of de facto segregation. Others, echoing the recent firestorm over calling immigration detention centers concentration camps, protested the use of a term associated with the Holocaust. In 1964, the Jewish intellectual Marie Sirkin wrote, quote, the term ghetto, now often prefixed with the adjective black, has a specific Jewish origin. It means literally a quarter to which Jews were restricted by law. She then added, in the immediate as well as historic experience of the Jews, a ghetto is not a metaphor. It is a concrete entity with walls, stormtroopers, and no exit save the gas chamber. Some African-American thinkers objected to the label for what they saw as its stigmatization of black communities. At a 1965 interview, the author Ralph Ellison described the portrayal of Harlem as a ghetto as, quote, one of the most damaging misuses of a concept that has ever come about in the United States. If a black writer, he claimed, accepted the description of, quote, Harlem as a Negro ghetto, which means, he said, to paraphrase one of our writers, piss in the halls and blood on the stairs, he'll never see the people of whom he wishes to write. Even as the word ghetto has come today to be seen first and foremost as part of the African-American experience, its usage is still not without controversy. Some view ghetto, especially when used colloquially as an adjective meaning cheap or second rate, as slanderous and racist. Others believe that the term powerfully conveys the intractable nature of black segregation, the reality that residents in inner city neighborhoods remains involuntary for most practically, if not legally. This leads me to my final question. Given how much the sense of the term has changed since its introduction 500 years ago, can we speak of a common history of ghettos that links 16th century Venice to the turn of the century Lower East Side, to the Warsaw Ghetto, 
to contemporary Harlem or the south side of Chicago. One approach to this problem would be to formulate a clearly bounded concept of the ghetto and restrict any history of ghettos to places that conform to the definition adopted. The eminent historian of the Venetian ghetto, Benjamin Ravit, for example, has argued for limiting the term ghetto to its original meaning of a legally compulsory, physically separated, and exclusive minority district. He explicitly rejects extending the label to the more general phenomenon of the Jewish quarter, and by implication to all cases involving structural or socioeconomic, but not statutory segregation. A history of ghettos, according to this definition, would include the early modern Italian ghettos and Holocaust ghettos, even allowing for the major differences between them, but it would exclude both immigrant ghettos and African-American ghettos. The sociologist Loic Vacant similarly insists on restricting the reach of the word ghetto, though he identifies four constituent elements of stigma, constraint, spatial confinement, and institutional parallelism to Ravid's three. He includes the African-American ghetto in his model, it excludes areas that are poor and run down, yet racially or ethnically heterogeneous, like the French banlieue or the Brazilian favelas. I agree with Ravid and Vacan that the differences between the myriad places past and present given the name ghetto are too profound to enable us to generate a definition that can embrace them all. Yet for all the differences between these places, they are nevertheless linked by the term ghetto, if not without controversy. They are part of the history of the word. And words change. They change by being stretched and molded to fit new, different, yet seemingly analogous circumstances. And then when new applications become normal and alter the sense of the words themselves. To quote the feminist historian Joan Scott, those who would codify the meanings of words fight a losing battle. For words, like the ideas and things they are meant to signify, have a history. It is only by sifting through, retracing, and sometimes retrieving the cluster of images and beliefs associated with the term ghetto, that the history of the ghetto can be written. Thank you. Well, I'm sure there, if, if we were all in person, there would be a round of applause from all 51 people. So um, I have a favor to ask of people who have questions. I see that one person asked to speak. Wait, please um, type in your questions in the Q and A. Uh, yeah, so rather than raise your hand, please um, use the Q&A feature. Uh, so you can just, um, I have some questions for Dan and but while I'm asking him questions, uh, if you could just type in your questions under Q&A and then um, I, will, um, I will ask them to, to Dan. So I know Elizabeth uh, Rich, you've raised your hand and there was someone who raised their hand before. So if you can put them in the Q&A feature, uh, thanks very much. Um, so, it's a fantastic talk and a fantastic book. And I have a couple of questions. One is if we can um, deprovincialize it a little bit beyond the Western world and talk about the relationship between ghetto and Melach. And I'm thinking of Emily Goderich's book on the, the, Mar the, the Marrakesh um, Melach and just to what extent we can talk mm -hmm. about global phenomenon and not just a Western one and how then we're relating it to a Muslim tradition and not a Christian tradition. The second question comes from my own childhood in California where we routinely refer to uh, neighborhoods where um, Latinos lived in large numbers as, as the barrio and the, never the term ghetto. And then just, you know, it's really interesting and it had a negative connotation, um, but, but the term, you know, and, and using a term from Spanish <clears throat> as opposed to a term imposed from out. So I wonder if you could comment a little bit maybe on that distinction. But then uh, because we live in a postmodern era of irony, I thought it'd be interesting to talk also a little bit about a self-deprecating use of the term ghetto to describe people who actually are living with great comfort, the yuppie ghetto. Um, every university community has its faculty ghetto. Yeah. And when I was in Berkeley as a graduate student, I lived in the gourmet ghetto. Yeah. So there's something going on there as well. Uh, so anyway, I just wanna throw those questions out and hopefully we'll get some, I see Q and A will be coming in while you're answering those. Sure. Um, so, okay, and the first question about uh, the ghetto and the um, Moroccan idea of the Melach. Um, and then, you know, in other countries in North Africa, for example, uh, they didn't necessarily call it the Melach. In Tunisia, for example, uh, they called it the Hara. Uh, but there are definitely similarities 
uh, in terms of both the timing. I mean, the Melach is institutionalized, you know, in the early modern period, similar to the ghetto, where, I mean, the ghetto becomes, at least in Italy and parts of Central Europe, uh, the normative form, you know, of Jewish settlement. Uh, so there are definitely similarities in terms of when uh, in North Africa, there is this pivot toward residential segregation. Uh, one different, well, first of all, the Melach is never really referred to as a, I mean, they have their own kind of um, native term. So it isn't really referred to the ghetto as the ghetto until you have uh, Western or Westernizing writers begin to uh, depict these areas in the 19th and 20th century. So for example, uh, in Albert Memmi's uh, Pillar of Salt, which is about the Tunisian Clara, where he even begins his life, he refers to it typically as the ghetto. But I see that as an attempt to kind of bridge to, you know, a French audience uh, and later, you know, an international audience that he's writing for. Uh, one difference between the Melanc and the ghetto, at least the ghetto in its original kind of Italian manifestation, uh, is that the segregation was not quite as airtight. In other words, the Melech may have been the area where the majority of Jews lived, but there tended to be exceptions. First of all, there tended to always be Jews who lived outside, wealthier Jews who lived outside the Melech. Moreover, there were non-Jews who lived within, especially you would often have Christians uh, who lived inside the Melech. So, and that was very different from the Italian ghetto where um, I mean, I said before that these were not prisons, but nevertheless, they were intended to be fully segregated Jewish areas. In other words, all the Jews in the city would have to move there, uh, and any Christian who was living there would have to move out. Uh, so that is one difference, uh, just in terms of the degree of segregation mm -hmm. uh, that you find in the ghetto vis-a-vis -vis the Melah. Uh, now, your second question about, yeah, so it's always, it's very interesting that, um, you know, that Hispanics, had their own kind of native term for their, you know, residential enclaves that they called it the barrio. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, I mean, I think the barrio obviously is a word that has uh, both, you know, negative and positive implications in the same way you see with ghetto, but I think with barrio, it's even a little bit more slanted toward the positive and that it's seen as something that is part you know, of a native lexicon. It's part of a culture, it's part of a tradition. Whereas ghetto is this imported word. I mean, it's interesting that African American, I mean, I guess there was this term, um, you know, the black belt, black belts that you know, was used initially to refer to areas of the South. And then when African Americans began migrating to the North, uh, very often before this term ghetto became normative, they, these areas were referred to as black belts. Um, uh, but there isn't this native term. I mean, you know, there's this kind of borrowing from the Jewish experience uh, in order, you know, to designate these areas. So I think that is an interesting difference. Um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, your final question, you know, this whole um, usage of the term to designate, you know, islands of relative privilege. So, you know, whether you want to talk about the gourmet ghetto in Berkeley or, you know, the ivory tower ghetto of academia um, or the gold, you know, gated, you know, golden, the gilded ghetto, um, gated communities as ghettos. Um, I think this is kind of an emptying of the term of some of its kind of long running um, significance, you know, in terms of the idea of a power relation uh, and the ghettoized is, you know, in a in a kind of subordinate position vis-a-vis -vis the ghettoizers. Um, so, you know, I tend to frown, you know, to put on a more prescriptive cap. I tend to frown on the use of the word in that way. Uh, but you're right that it is very much, you know, a sign of just how um, widespread usage of the term has become. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so if people have questions, I think there was one person had a hand up and then it disappeared. And I don't know if the Q&A function is not working or if people are wanting to talk or, but if you have questions, please, the floor is open. 
Um, and I know that I can respond um, if people type in their questions. I'm not sure if I can actually unmute people and people can speak. I don't know about the technology for that because when I've done this before, people have, um, have done the questions through typing them up. So are there questions? No, oh, there's a question. Huh, here we go. Okay, I just heard from our IT people. I can unmute them. Okay, so if you would rather pose your question um, in something that we call speech, then uh, please do that and uh, you can be unmuted. I didn't even know that was possible, that's great. So if you want to, um, if you have a question then and you'd like to ask it the old fashioned way, let me know, use the raise hand feature and I can, um, you can be unmuted. Let's see what's going on here. You can unmute them, right? Okay. I thought Alex had his hand. I thought that Alex Sagan had. Alex, didn't you have your hand up? I didn't, Derek, but you've unmuted me and I can ask something anyway. Oh, okay. I thought you had your hand up. I'm sorry. Anyway. No, I didn't. But you can't see me. You can just hear me, right? Yes, but I see your face. It's nice to see your face. Even oh, you do see me. Well, it's just a photograph, but. Oh, I should be able to change that. Well, I guess sure. I can't. Um, hi, Daniel. Thanks. Very, uh, very interesting talk. So I was trying to understand a few questions, but I'll just ask one. A little bit more precisely, since I haven't read the book, how you are describing the transition of the term in America to describe uh, the African-American uh, urban settlement mm -hmm. and how much of it was a sort of a conceptual borrowing of the term and how much of it was related to the fact that many of the areas that became areas of black settlement had been areas of Jewish settlement. Mm -hmm. It seemed that you might've been referring to both and I wasn't sure I understood the weight of the two variables or the interaction. Can you talk a little bit more about that process? Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's a great question. And I think the elements of both were influential. I mean, you know, you definitely see, um, you know, in the first half of the 20th century, when you're beginning to see African American intellectuals in particular appropriating the term to refer to African American segregated areas. Um, there is very much a sense that they are, you know, consciously appropriating it, borrowing it from the Jewish experience. Uh, and this only kind of gained steam, you know, during, uh, you know, the years of World War II uh, and the Holocaust, when I think very much um, the use of the term was meant to shock, uh, you know, at a time when United States was fighting Nazism and fascism in Europe, uh, including, you know, the idea of you know, the ghettos, which you know, were known throughout the world. Uh, to use the term uh, basically was a way of almost saying, like, you know, you think the problems are just overseas, the problems are right here at home. Uh, so not, without necessarily making a kind of precise analogy between the Nazi ghettos and African American ghettos, nevertheless, I think you know, there was an attempt to kind of capitalize on the Holocaust overtones of the term. Uh, but I think, it, as you point out, I mean, it's also very much correct that many of the areas that became black ghettos had originally been, you know, Jewish ghettos, or at least Jewish enclaves. Uh, you know, in 1948, uh, James Baldwin publishes an, uh, an essay in Commentary Magazine called The Harlem Ghetto. Um, and where he's dealing, you know, for the most part with black Jewish relations centering on the ghetto. And, you know, one of the issues that he's dealing with is this transition of the area from a, you know, largely Jewish area to a black area and the role that Jews continued to play in this area, even after they had largely moved out. So the fact that Jews often remain in these areas as, shopkeepers, small businessmen, um, merchants, 
teachers, social workers, superintendents, you know, and the like. Uh, and that becomes a major, you know, point of contention uh, in, you know, the you know, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and on uh, about Jews who are increasingly seen as the face of white America uh, within the ghetto. Um, and almost the desire to kind of drive the Jews out, you know, of the ghetto. So I think that both of those elements, you know, the fact these areas had a history of being labeled ghettos, but also very much um, a very conscious, deliberate appropriation of the term from the Jewish lexicon, both of these were influential. I thought that Jacqueline Scher, I thought your hand was up at one point, I don't see it now. So if you're, if you'd like to ask a question, please do let me know. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question. There's something I remember hearing when I was, when I've been doing adult education over the years, people will talk about not just the pale of settlement as a ghetto, but they talk about the ghettos. And the phrase that I hear in sort of popular parlance is the shtetls and ghettos of Eastern Europe. So, and, and, and again, it's, it's not an entirely negative, it, it's tied up with nostalgia. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. And I guess, it, you know, it's tied up with your work on the Lower East Side, but also, um, and then Zangwill's um, Children of the Ghetto. Mm -hmm. And where that fits in this discourse of um, whether it's criticism or nostalgia and the connection with, with the shtetl, which after all is not a ghetto. Right. So, yeah, I mean, the shtetl, I mean, what's interesting about the shtetl um, is that, you know, during the 19th century, uh, you know, Western European, Central European Jewish authors typically referred to these areas as ghettos. Uh, I mean, you had a whole um, literary movement uh, for the creation of this ghetto literature that very often focused on East European Jews and what we today would call the shtetl, um, but they referred to them as ghettos. So they became common to refer to the ghettos of Eastern Europe, even though in reality, you know, if we judge by the original kind of definition of both, uh, a shtetl was not a ghetto. I mean, a shtetl was like a small market town surrounded by countryside uh, where Jews were often uh, at least a preponderant element of the population, sometimes a plurality, sometimes even a majority. Uh, but while there may have been Jewish areas of the shtetl, Jewish streets, Jewish quarters um, that were mostly Jewish, there was no legal segregation per se. That's very different from the phenomenon of the ghetto where you have you know, a minority population being housed in a quarter as part of a city. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean, that really is inaccurate to refer to ghettos in Eastern Europe prior to the Holocaust. Many of the areas that are referred to as ghettos are either shtetls or when Jews begin to migrate to larger cities within the Pale. Um, they are mainly these kind of Jewish enclaves of these areas that are often very poor, very run down. Um, and there may be some segregation in these places where Jews might be restricted from living in certain places, but these are not mandatory ghettos. So again, that's just a, an instance of the you know kind of slippery usage of the term. Um, but yes, I mean, there's an element in the history of both the ghetto and certainly the shtetl. You know, when the shtetl becomes, um, you know, a global term, you know, used in non-Jewish languages. There is an element of nostalgia. Uh, you see that in ghetto literature, but I think it's even more common in writing about the shtetl, uh, which doesn't have often the same negative baggage that I think the term ghetto came to have in particular as a result of the Holocaust. And then with its kind of association with black America, the shtetl then became this kind of like locus of Jewishness par excellence. Oh, questions are beginning to pour in. Um, and there's a lot of great questions. So um, I'll just take them in order, just one second. Um, this is from Francesca Bregoli. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. She mentions the sociologist Richard Sennett, who has referred to the paradox of the early modern ghetto 
as productive and yet degrading. I'm curious about your take on Senate's approach, whether it could be applied to other forms of the ghetto as you trace them over time. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question. Um, I think that you know, Senate's analysis uh, of the ghetto in is this book called Flesh and Stone, which is a history of um, the city and how it maps out um, in terms of ideas about the body. Uh, so he has a chapter that focuses on the Venetian ghetto. Uh, and you're right, he describes it as a kind of paradoxical space. In fact, he uses a very suggestive metaphor to refer to the ghetto. He calls it an urban condom. Uh, so it's somewhat problematic uh, in that if it were a condom, it was a it was a quite faulty one uh, in that, you know, there were, you know, the ghetto, the boundaries of the ghetto uh, were porous. Uh, there were, you know, Jews left the ghetto during the day, often to, you know, to travel, to do, to do business elsewhere in the city, um, to travel elsewhere to other ghettos, um, you know, to travel between Italian cities, um, sometimes to visit Gentile acquaintances, and and Christians came into the ghetto uh, to do business with Jews, um, and also you know sometimes to visit with Jewish acquaintances. We have you know evidence of Christians attending uh, the sermons of one of the famous rabbis of the Venetian ghetto, uh, Leon de Modena. Uh, so the condom is a problematic metaphor, but I think that this kind of tension that he describes between the ghetto as you know a kind of a, a, a degrading place but also one that is reclaimed by the Jews themselves as a kind of fortress uh, meant to kind of protect their way of life uh, is something that I think you do see uh, in the history of other ghettos um, and you know, perhaps the Verona case being a, a salient example of the extent to which the ghetto might be perceived as a kind of fortress protecting the community from attrition and you know the far worse state of expulsion. The, your, the last few sentences particularly respond to the next question um, from Suzanne Klingenstein about the profile of the positive connotation of the ghetto as preserving cultural identity. Um, and you refer to it in the Italian sense, but I think um, uh, you've answered that. Uh, there's another question that's <laughs> interesting, but controversial. Uh, this might be out off the wall, uh, says Madeline Levy, but are there appropriations or uses of the term ghetto in the context of the Israel-Palestine conflict? That is, are there, would there be discourse in Israel referring to Palestinian areas as ghettos or is that language, is that language used, is it not used? Uh, so yes, I mean, the term ghetto has definitely been appropriated uh, both in Israeli politics, uh, as well as in reference to the Palestinians. Um, so, you know, I see this term as being appropriated both by, you know, the Israeli left and the Israeli right, but for diff with different objectives. Uh, the Israeli left often likes to refer to Israel as, you know, you know under Netanyahu, um, as, you know, becoming, you know, a ghetto. Mm. Uh, and this has been a, you know, a critique of not just Netanyahu, but of, you know, Likud politicians dating back to Begin that, in other words, by kind of turning a deaf ear to the international community and its concerns, uh, and, you know, pursuing a kind of foreign policy of a nation that dwells alone, uh, that the Israeli right is turning Israel into a, a somewhat expanded ghetto. Uh, whereas the right will often accuse the left um, you know, particularly on, you know, I mean, this has become less relevant in recent years, but on issues of territorial compromise. Uh, the right, you know, uh, would blame the left for turning Israel into a ghetto because this idea that Israel within the 1967 borders uh, would only be, you know, uh, you know, would be so reduced in size that would only be a ghetto. And in fact, you find this usage of the term ghetto in you know, revisionist Zionism dating back to the 1920s, you know, often uh, in reference to specific, you know, partition proposals. Mm. Um, but, you know, yes, the term has come to be referred, you know, applied to Palestinians as well, in particular the Palestinians of Gaza. I mean, there was a, 
whole documentary that came out in the 80s called Gaza Ghetto. I mean, during the various conflicts between Israel and Gaza, whether in 2009 or 2014, comparisons between Gaza and the Warsaw Ghetto have been rife, often invoked by the Palestinians themselves and often rejected by Israelis. So yes, I would say this term has become something of a weapon, both within Israeli politics and then in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict more generally. Um, that's great. And Suzanne follows up with a couple of uh, related questions. One is, I mean, it sounds like the term ghetto has become a floating signifier. And the question is whether you as a scholar of the subject would ideally, you know, would you want people to use the word only in a certain way? Or are you okay with this capacious, wide ranging, and sometimes it seems quite contradictory uh, use of the term. And related to that, that notion of ghetto as a positive term uh, used in the Jewish sense, but also Suzanne Klingenstein's question refers to African-American, the idea of self-segregation creating a protected space for cultural creation, uh, whether that might be, I mean, you've talked about how Jews might use that term or have used that uh, term, but also whether it's African-Americans, she's even asking about other groups, Palestinians. Uh, anyway, good questions both. Uh, yeah, no, excellent questions. Um, so I, yeah, I'm essentially of two minds on you know, the question you're posing. You know, on the one hand, certainly in the book itself, I reject the idea of um, embracing a specific definition of the ghetto against which then I judge later iterations of the word and concept. Um, and that, you know, I think the reality is, is that words don't belong to pe specific peoples. Uh, when they are generalized, when they are conceptualized, when they are universalized in that way, they become ripe for the picking and ripe for appropriation. And that's just the reality. Um, that's you know simply a descriptive account of how words work. Uh, and ghetto has been no different. Now, if I were to put on a more prescriptive hat, if I were operating more as a sociologist, uh, then let's say as a historian. So there I would say that a more useful definition of ghetto and ghettoization would necessarily involve some type of external force involved in its creation and perpetuation. Whether, you know, I, I wouldn't be as strict as Ben Ravid, who I see arguing that this has to be, you know, essentially segregation by law explicitly, you know, statutory segregation. Um, you know, I think, you know, the kind of, uh, state actions involved in creating and maintaining black ghettoization would also apply. But I think if you lose this element of force, you lose a key part of what constitu constitutes uh, a ghetto. I would also say that, you know, I tend to frown on the more colloquial uses of the term today. Uh, people, when you, you go refer to, you know, use this phrase, that's so ghetto. Uh, and I think there are definitely negative connotations. There are, um, you know, offensive connotations. I think that, you know, it's one thing, I mean, ghetto has kind of be, been reclaimed by African-Americans, often the way you see sometimes slurs that then are, you know, claimed by a particular group and revalorized. Uh, and something similar has happened to ghetto, even though the usage of the term in the African-American community, community uh, is also controversial. Uh, but I don't like it when I hear, you know, white teenagers refer to some outfit as, oh, that's so ghetto. I think that there is something uh, somewhat insulting and even insidious about it. Well, it's really interesting, this, this notion of how, again, how a, phrase, a term that is um, indicative of uh, suffering and humiliation then becomes, well, it, it becomes frivolous. Um, and that brings up a question about apartheid and whole, you know, I don't know, did the, the term ghetto show up in the South African discursive context of apartheid, homelands, Bantu stands? Did, did that language also appear? Uh, so it did, um, you know, starting in the, you know, the late 1940s with the rise of apartheid, you do see um, people beginning to refer to the townships uh, and just to the larger process of, you know, segregation 
as you know, imposing a ghetto, you know, in South Africa, uh, you do see that language. Um, again, whether the term ghetto, in its you know original sense, or in, in you know even this the sense you know of a you know kind of enclave of a larger city, a mandatory enclave of a larger city, how well that actually works with the townships, you know, is another question, uh, and one that I'm not so prepared to answer. But I can say that you do see the you know appropriation of the language of ghettoization in the South African context. In fact, N Nelson Mandela, you know, in the speech he gave during his trial uh, in the early 1960s, he refers to the townships as ghettos. So just as one example. Yeah, so the word gets global, like you said, it takes on global uh, usage. Um, a question that refers to one particular application of the term that might not quite fit the Shanghai ghetto. Mm -hmm. um, that's a kind of an unusual historical circumstance. Yeah, so the Shanghai, Shanghai ghetto being this um, area, you know, in Shanghai where um, European Jews uh, who had managed to escape Nazi Europe um, where they were basically interned uh, by the Japanese occupiers. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I think that there are some problems in terms of defining, first of all, this area, I once asked somebody who had grown up uh, Jewish in Shanghai, not as, you know, not as one of these European refugees, but someone who had been earlier, you know, part of uh, ref Russian refugee families. Uh, who in the 19-teens, 1920s, uh, moved uh, to Shanghai. I asked her, did people refer to the area at the time as the ghetto? And she actually told me no, uh, mm -hmm. that this was just a later term that was imposed on it. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't know so much about the Shanghai ghetto, but my sense is that um, the degree of segregation was not as airtight as it was in the case of the Italian ghettos. Um, you know, it, there were certainly restrictions on the, you know, European Jewish internees ability in terms of their mobility, uh, but it was not, you know, exactly the same as the Italian ghettos. And there's this also, this is chime in, this memory of, 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 uh, of, of gratitude and appreciation. You know, I, I um, talked to people who were descended from that uh, world. Actually, I knew a woman who was a child in the Shanghai community and, uh, you know, I was very grateful for it. So, and then we have time for one, I think one more uh, question. This is a question also from Francesca Bregoli about when the term begins more, you know, more and more widely used in the 1950s and 60s in relation to issues of anti-Black racism and segregation in the US, was there then a debate within Jewish circles about the significance of this? That is, are, are people aware at the time that this word transference is taking place? And was Jewish activism during the civil rights movement constructed or understood around that word transfer? So to what extent was this something that was that was um, visible and not latent and not, 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 uh, not yeah. opaque? Yeah, so great question. Um, and yes, I think you know, Jews were very much aware, and the Jews had a re diversity of responses to the reality of this transfer. Um, you know, some, you know, sought to, you know, I emphasize uh, the fact that both, you know, Jews and African Americans had experienced ghettos. In other words, to form, you know, a kind of bridge between the Jewish and African American experience. Um, you know, I mean, I, I found advertisements, for example, you know, of the American Jewish Congress um, saying things like, we've both experienced slavery in our history. We've both experienced ghettos. Again, calling for Black Jewish solidarity. Um, there was an amicus brief. I mentioned this uh, Supreme Court case, Shelley versus Kramer in 1948. So there was an amicus brief submitted by four Jewish organizations, uh, which also referenced the idea of the ghetto and said the Jews basically are familiar with the, the evils of the ghetto from our history. And knowing such, we don't want to see that idea take root on American soil. Uh, so there are attempts to you know, form 
you know, some use the word as a kind of bridge between the Jewish and African American experiences to mobilize Jews on behalf of civil rights through this idea of the shared history of the term ghetto. But as I also mentioned in the lecture, in the lecture there are Jews who uh, recoil uh, against this transfer. Uh, and you know, particular given the most recent Jewish history of the term in the Holocaust, you know, with the Warsaw ghetto, with the Ludge ghetto as the kind of like dominant frame of reference, uh, you know, it was seen as quite similar to this concentration camp controversy, uh, making uh, a fallacious Holocaust analogy. Uh, and so, you know, intellectuals like Maurice Sirkin and others pushed back on the ap application of the term to African American areas and tried to kind of hold on to it as a Jewish term. So, yes, yeah, some type of sense of the, you know, there's a kind of cultural appropriation going on here that is inappropriate and misleading and should be stemmed. Uh, so, you see, you know, this range of responses. Just to finish with one final, it's a question that also I'm going to turn into a comment. There was a Anglo-Jewish leader in the early 20th century, Goldsmith, a really fascinating guy, wound up becoming a Zionist activist. And anyway, he was the head of something called the Jewish Lads Brigade, uh, which worked with Jews in the East End. And, they, and their slogan was to iron out the ghetto bend, you know, to basically turn these miserable East European Jewish kids into strapping young British Jews with barrel chests. And um, Alex notes that in African-American internal discourse, it can be a term of opprobrium by more, I don't know, affluent or um, socially mobile or assimilated, however we define this, uh, African-Americans versus those who they seem to be less assimilated and with an implication of denigration and that Jews could say the same thing. You know, we're not children of the ghetto, you're a child of the ghetto. And I was just thinking about that phrase, ironing out the ghetto bend. And that might be a nice way to and if you want to comment on that a little bit. Yeah, so so this idea of the ghetto bend uh, is one that entered um, Jewish eth ethnology, you know, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, John Efron has written interestingly about the whole idea of the ghetto bend in terms of, you know, the medicalization of discourse about Jews uh, and other minorities. Uh, and it was this idea of this kind of crookedness in the Jewish male back in particular, the sense of being hunched over, uh, that it was one of the uh, lingering traits uh, of segregation uh, and something that by removing the Jews from the ghettos was thought, you know, you would be able to, as you said, to iron it out. Uh, so it was this kind of like physical stigmata you know, of the ghetto experience that was imprinted on the very body and the, primarily the male body, the, the body of Jewish males, I should say. To be a zakuf kuma, as I say yeah. in Hebrew, or komemiut, a very <laughs> interesting, I think it's a hapex legomen in the Hebrew Bible, komemiut, uh, standing tall. So, which by the way, is a great segue to our uh, seminar on November 6th with Machal Dekal about the Tehran children because they're ties into Zionism. So anyway, this has been a really enjoyable and interesting uh, and engaging uh, seminar. Thank you, Dan, for your great talk and comments. Thank you all for your questions. Look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. And until then, I hope you all stay well. And I hope that the, on the political front, the next few weeks will be a little bit calmer than we may suspect. Thank you all.